So again, welcome to everyone for UHS Grand Rounds. Today we have the pleasure of having Dr. Ian Nealon joining us. He is the director of the UH Center for Cardiovascular Prevention and the co-director of the UH Cinema Program. Um, I'm going to go into an um, introduction for Dr. Nealon, but I just want to remind everyone the CME code for today's presentation is 43370. All right, so Dr. Nealon earned his medical degree at Mount Sinai School of Medicine. He completed an internal medicine residency at Emory University School of Medicine and served as the chief medical resident at the Veterans Affair Hospital in Atlanta. He also earned a certificate in translational medicine from Emory's Laney Graduate School. In 2011, he moved to Dallas, Texas, where he completed a combined clinical and research fellowships in cardiovascular medicine at UC Southwestern Medical Center. After graduating from cardiology fellowship, Dr. Nealon joined the faculty at UC Southwestern, where he was a Deadman Family Scholar in clinical care and an active clinician and researcher. Dr. Nealon is certified by the American Board of Internal Medicine in both internal medicine and cardiovascular diseases, and he also holds a subspecialty certification in adult echocardiography and nuclear cardiology. Dr. Nealon joined, joined us here at University Hospitals in 2020 in the midst of the COVID pandemic. He is pending Associate Professor of Medicine at Case Western Reserve University and serves as Director of the University Hospital Center for Cardiovascular Prevention and also as Co-Director of the Center for Integrated and Novel Approaches in Vascular Metabolic Diseases, um, uh, the acronym for which is CINEMA at University Hospital which is a novel program designed to address diabetes and cardiovascular risk in a multidisciplinary and comprehensive manner. He is an active clinical and translational investigator funded in part by the NIH with a research program focused on understanding the relationship between dysfunctional adiposity and diabetes and cardiovascular disease risk. He serves on multiple national committees with the AHA and ACC that address issues related to lifestyle medicine and cardiometabolic risk. Please help me welcome Dr. Nealon. Thank you so much. Um, it really is a, a, a treat to speak with you today, and I appreciate the opportunity um, to speak with everyone. Let me go ahead and see if I can advance. Yeah, these are my disclosures. So I'd like to start with an illustrative case to kind of describe the concept um, of obesity heterogeneity that I'll be speaking about today. And this case is a 43-year-old gentleman insurance consultant who uh, has a BMI of 26, which is mildly overweight. His LDL cholesterol is what I would probably consider on, uh, on average for the population, and his blood pressure um, mildly elevated with um, mild stage one hypertension, and he has South Asian ancestry. So for all intents and purposes, uh, you look at this gentleman and you know not consider him to be at significantly elevated risk for uh, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. But as part of a preventive uh, assessment, he undergoes specialized body fat imaging by MRI and advanced lipid analysis. And lo and behold, it turns out that his visceral adipose tissue is at the 95th percentile for his age and BMI. He has a significant burden of liver fat with a fat fraction of 25%. He also has an atherogenic dyslipidemic profile characterized by small, dense LDL particles, an increased number of those particles, as well as high triglycerides and high ApoB. And finally, he's in the pre-diabetic range with an A1C of 6%. So based upon this, we can see that although from an outside view, he appears to be a low risk, he really is obese on the inside, which pretends an elevated cardiovascular disease risk. And it's this, this, you know, this connection of obesity with obesity heterogeneity that I want to discuss today to describe for you to so have a good understanding um, of how to um, use this in your practice and further research. So I think despite what popular opinion and social media out there would tell you, there is indeed an obesity problem in 2021. And this issue uh, has been brewing for decades, such that obesity rates have more than doubled globally in 73 countries since 1980. Um, and it has not uh, been uh, limited to the Western world. The developing world now uh, with, you know, introduction of a Western diet, um, you know, have, has been developing obesity as well. So it's no longer uh, just an issue of the United States and Canada. 
And certainly in the United States, obesity is on the rise, including among youth, which is uh, very alarming. Just that now about 40% of uh, the population has obesity, as I'll talk about later. Uh, and even probably more concerning is one in every five uh, youths and adolescents uh, meet the criteria for obesity. And furthermore, what we're seeing is that it's not just obesity in general on the rise, but severe obesity. So that 10% of the population can be defined as having severe obesity. And that uh, equates to about a quarter of all patients with obesity. So it's certainly uh, an increasing problem that has been growing for the last 20 years and does not necessarily show any evidence of stopping anytime soon. And certainly uh, us here in Ohio are not immune uh, to the obesity epidemic. We sit there um, in between multiple states that are at the top uh, of obesity prevalence in the United States. Um, and ours, uh, you know, the last estimates between 30 to 35% of all individuals in Ohio uh, meet criteria for obesity. So it's certainly a very prevalent problem. Um, and as I'll point out, uh, a very serious problem that needs, uh, you know, better tools and, and better understanding of how to treat it uh, so that we can then uh, improve outcomes. So just so that we all have the same vocabulary and can have a, uh, an interactive dialogue about uh, obesity and what we're talking about, um, let me define it for you. So obesity is defined actually by a single metric, and that is the body mass index or BMI which simply is uh, your weight in kilograms of your height in meters squared. And for adults, this is interpreted using what we call standard weight categories. So a BMI below 18.5 is defined as underweight. Uh, a BMI of 18.5 to 24.9 is normal or healthy weight. Above that, uh, until you reach 30 is overweight, and then 30 and above is obese. And indeed, the uh, ACC and AHA guidelines do recognize this um, definition of obesity and structure such that they recommend measuring height and weight and calculating the BMI at least annually to, to um, understand one, the diagnosis of obesity and then to provide patients with counseling surrounding that. Now, obesity can be further classified um, using mild, moderate and severe categories again, based on the BMI, such that mild uh, is where your BMI is 30 to 34.9, moderate is 35 to 39.9, and severe are what people would call uh, morbid obesity uh, develops when your BMI is at least 40 or above. So there are certainly you know, gradations uh, for BMI and how we define it and how we, and how we understand it, but, uh, but it's completely defined just by that one metric alone. Now, I think it's self-evident and, and you know, everyone knows here that um, obesity defined by the BMI certainly portends greater risk for cardiovascular disease, type two diabetes and all cause mortality. And these data are just one illustrative example uh, of the connection between obesity and cardiovascular disease risk. These are data from Saja Khan at Northwestern where she looked at 10 large US population cohorts including 3.2 million person years of follow-up. And what she showed was there is a gradient as BMI increases, the lifetime risk for cardiovascular disease mortality and morbidity increases as well. So that the highest levels of BMI, those uh, defined as morbidly obese, um, you know, have a lifetime risk of approaching 80% uh, in men and 60% in women uh, for cardiovascular disease morbidity and mortality. So it's, it's clearly a metric that's useful to define population level risk um, and as reflected in the guidelines, it's important for uh, providers to advise patients that in general, the greater the BMI, the greater the risk uh, of adverse outcomes like cardiovascular disease and death. Now, this is important not just for uh, cardiovascular disease and other cardiometabolic diseases, uh, but obesity is a major risk factor for adverse outcomes in COVID-19 as well. Uh, these data from a recent publication uh, out of hospitalized patients with COVID-19 from the American Heart Association Get With the Guidelines uh, Registry shows that in hospital outcomes of death or mechanical ventilation, uh, as well as major adverse cardiac events, uh, venous thromboembolism and renal replacement therapy increases in almost a linear fashion with increasing obesity class. 
uh, with where normal weight as the comparison, you know, people who are class three obesity, the severe range uh, are close to twofold risk of developing uh, mechanical ventilation uh, or death. So, you know, this is clearly an issue that has become to the forefront actually of public uh, vision because of the obesity of the COVID epidemic. Um, and uh, we saw, uh, you know, last year, many individuals who are young, but otherwise, and otherwise healthy with obesity, uh, succumb to the disease, uh, you know, due to their, their body weight. So the other thing um, is waist circumference that plays, a, a, it's a factor in uh, understanding and, and assessing obesity. Um, and waist circumference is measured by placing a measuring tape around the abdomen, the level of superior border of the iliac crest. There's a couple ways to measure, but this is usually the most, the one that uh, most research uh, endeavors use. Um, and indeed, the uh, guidelines have a class 2A recommendation to measure waist circumference, at least annually or more frequently in overweight and obese adults. And the reason for this is that waist circumference actually gives a, a window, an insight into the concept of obesity heterogeneity. And the reason for that is that a waist circumference of a, over 40 inches for men and 35 inches for women is actually associated with a higher risk for adverse metabolic consequences of adiposity, but regardless of the BMI category. So waist circumference adds independent information to BMI and indeed shows the concept that at any level of BMI, there is additional risk gratification information um, uh, for adiposity that's able to be measured by the waist circumference. Um, and so certainly BMI should not be the only thing that we, we measure, waist circumference is important as well. However, um, be, waist circumference has not entered clinical practice uh, to any great degree uh, in my assessment. And so BMI remains the primary and usually solely metric, sole metric that we have to, to measure, define, um, and monitor obesity. And the issue with that is whether or not BMI is really sufficient to predict and manage risk. Um, and it's, it's an important question because if it is not, there needs to be other metrics we use to help better define risk and monitor our therapies and counsel patients. So there are several reasons why BMI may not be sufficient. The first one is that the BMI health outcomes relationship really is quite heterogeneous. So for example, uh, this study took individuals with varying body mass indexes uh, from normal to obese, and they performed steady state plasma glucose uh, to evaluate the level of insulin resistance. Now, in general, what they saw was there was a linear correlation between BMI and steady state plasma glucose, which was indicative of worsening insulin resistance as BMI increased. But you could see that at any given level of BMI, there is significant variability uh, in the steady state plasma glucose. And so BMI alone is unable to discriminate at the individual level between someone who has normal insulin resistance and abnormal insulin resistance. So you see that BMI alone is not the decisor uh, for health outcomes uh, for this example. And the other piece of this is that BMI is actually not a component of the pull cohort equations, which is the risk calculator we use uh, to assess risk for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, nor was it a component of the Framingham risk score. And this has been shown uh, in other ways, but one way I, I like to, to you know, point it out is a study that we did out of uh, eight cohorts, including over 30,000 people uh, in the United States. And we showed that um, BMI groups um, are actually well calibrated to the pooled cohort equation. So at the decision threshold between five to 7.5% and 75 to 20%, where you'd be trying to decide whether or not to initiate statins or, or other preventive therapies based on ASCVD risk, the pooled cohort equation was well calibrated regardless of the BMI. So not only does BMI not enter into the equation, but the equation seems to be consistent uh, and well calibrated regardless of the BMI, which suggests that BMI does not uh, contribute any additional information to ASCVD risk, um, at least in this construct. So again, um, you know, why not? And if, if there is an uh, increased risk for CVD, as I mentioned, and, and other risk factors for obesity, why is the BMI not uh, independently contributing? 
The, the other thing that uh, is very interesting and maybe uh, many on the, on the video today uh, are not aware of is a concept called metabolically healthy obesity. And what this is, uh, is a health condition such that someone does not have any metabolic uh, diseases or issues, and it's determined by clinical cutoffs to define abnormal levels of risk factors. So there are, you know, are people in the, in the population um, where they have no metabolic syndrome components and they have no insulin resistance. And uh, from this particular study in 2019 out of JCI, showed that about 7% of the entire population that they studied uh, fit into this category. If you relax your criteria somewhat and just say, you know, how many people who are obese do not have any metabolic syndrome components, but may have some insulin resistance, you're talking about 13%. And if you're just using insulin resistance with home IR, it's up to a quarter. So, you know, one fourth of all patients with obesity seem to have very low and controlled risk factors. Um, and so that, that, you know, bred the concept of metabolically healthy obesity that, oh, there are obese people out there who, um, you know, do not have risk for disease. Well, it turns out that about 50% of those individuals become metabolically unhealthy given enough time. Um, and that there's an increased risk for adverse long-term outcomes, even in the absence of metabolic abnormalities, uh, when the BMI threshold for obesity is reached. So the concept of metabolically healthy obesity seems to be somewhat of a misnomer and depends on length of follow -up. But again, uh, describes uh, a concept behind heterogeneity within a BMI category. The next um, you know, very interesting concept that um, you may or may not be aware of is what's called the obesity paradox. And this is a highly debated, highly controversial topic. But in general, what it means is that in patients with uh, overweight or mild obesity and established cardiovascular disease, that the BMI itself is actually associated with better short-term CBD outcomes compared with normal weight. So for example, uh, patients with heart failure who are cachectic and low weight have worse outcomes than patients with heart failure who are mildly obese. And you may think to yourself, well, that's paradoxical, right? A patient with obesity has worsening risk factors, more insulin resistance, higher chance for diabetes, and should have worse outcomes, but indeed it's actually the opposite. And there are several potential explanations for this. Um, some pos posit that it's lead time bias where patients with worse obesity, especially in that severe range, tend to be younger and therefore diagnoses occur earlier and treatment is initiated earlier. So outcomes are therefore um, altered. Another explanation is the concept of sarcopenia. And that really is germane to the, the heart failure example because patients with heart failure uh, tend to have low BMI because they have a low um, body fat percentage and actually uh, low muscle mass. And they uh, therefore become cachectic. And so there's an issue with uh, cardiometabolic reserve uh, in the face of disease. So they just, they can't mount that response. Uh, and finally, the obesity heterogeneity concept um, may underlie um, variation either in cardiorespiratory fitness. So it could be that obese patients who are able to um, maintain good fitness through physical activity, uh, or uh, if you did, for example, a stress test to measure their, uh, their METs, how far they could go, those folks uh, tend to have lower, uh, better outcomes. And then um, something that I think I'll go into more detail about, which I think is very important, is variation in visceral and ectopic fat burden. Could that potentially explain the difference in outcomes related to BMI, such as some people with high BMI have low visceral ectopic fat and some have higher? And I'll get into that a lot more. Uh, through the talk. The obesity paradox um, has been shown in several conditions, both cardiovascular and non-cardiovascular. And um, to illustrate this concept, you know, you could, you could plot uh, outcomes on the y-axis and BMI on the x-axis, and you'll see usually a U-shaped or a J-shaped curve. And in many situations, people with quote-unquote normal weight tend to be at highest, higher risk or just as high risk as someone who's severely obese. Um, and we've shown this for uh, outcomes post-STEMI. Uh, this has been shown for heart failure, many different situations. And the, and the idea is that either are the people with you know, normal weight, um, are they really that normal? Is it an issue of cachexia, sarcopenia? Um, you know, uh, is it an issue of smoking? So confounding. So that, that, that's always a controversial topic. But again, the obesity paradox should illustrate for you that uh, not all obesity is created equal. And so it's really the concept of obesity heterogeneity that uh, is important 
to discern and to utilize in decision making. And, and I'll, I'll kind of describe that for you more. So take, for example, a population sample of obese individuals, right? Over time, many people may get diabetes and others will get heart disease, but actually a significant proportion of those will maintain metabolic health and will not develop uh, ASCVD. And the, the, the question is why? So if you would take, I like to kind of show this with a Venn diagram, if you take uh, populations of patients with obesity, cardiovascular disease and metabolic disease, such as diabetes, um, there certainly is uh, overlap and there are, are areas where patients may have one or the other, but not, but not both. And this nexus between the three, this overlap is what I would term dysfunctional adiposity, which means that it's obesity and adiposity that becomes dysfunctional, that is not uh, physiologic any longer and um, is no longer uh, you know, serving the function that uh, nature would intend. Now to better define what dysfunctional adiposity is as a construct, um, I like to say that the pathologic response by adipose tissue uh, to positive caloric balance in susceptible individuals, that's very key, that either directly or indirectly contributes to cardiovascular and metabolic disease. And there are four primary uh, components of this, I think, that uh, would characterize dysfunctional adiposity. First and foremost uh, are excess visceral and ectopic fat deposition. And if you're not aware or um, of, of what that is in that concept, I'm going to go into that much, uh, in much greater detail. But further beyond that, there's uh, a concept of inflammatory and adipokine dysregulation. Body fat is actually an active endocrine organ um, and secretes multiple different substances uh, that can actually uh, have receptors uh, and organs across the body. Um, insulin resistance is also a very important piece of this. And you can have insulin resistance with or without ectopic fat, but certainly there is a, a strong overlap. And finally, uh, for ASCVD, atherogenic dyslipidemia or a profile of abnormal uh, lipoprotein lipid contents um, portends the idea that there's a dysfunctional uh, fat here. And that that's connected between the adipose uh, organ as well as the liver. Um, and, and so these four characteristics make up dysfunctional adiposity and is a construct that's very useful to think about uh, when taking care of patients. And I'll explain why. So first, let me just describe visceral and ectopic fat, um, what this means. So take two patients, for example, okay? Um, they both have the same BMI, 27, and they both have the same waist circumference. Uh, 91, 92. So you can see that uh, you cannot differentiate, uh, at least from BMI and waist circumference alone, between who has a healthy fat profile and who has an unhealthy fat profile. And what we can see is that by doing an MRI in these patients and actually looking and measuring the fat content, you don't even, you can see with your eyes already between the pink and uh, the, the pink levels there on the two patients, is that the patient on the right has a lot of visceral fat. That's fat around the internal abdominal organs, um, 9.3 liters, which is close to three and a half times that of the person on the left, where very little visceral fat, very little pink. And so despite BMI and waste being the same, the visceral fat burden is highly variable. And that may be the key metric to define the hydrogenity of obesity and be the key driver of risk. And indeed, excess visceral fat is a significant risk factor for cardiovascular disease, independent of BMI and waist circumference. And along with visceral fat goes what we call ectopic fat. I means fat in a place where it doesn't belong. And that's usually accumulation of fat in normally lean tissues, such as the heart, the liver, the kidney, the pancreas, and skeletal muscle. And fat can go anywhere uh, throughout the body. And depending upon where it goes, uh, it may have differential effects on different organ systems uh, and outcomes. And what we do know is that lifestyle pharmacologic therapy and surgical treatments for weight loss, it may have actually a greater impact relatively on reducing visceral and ectopic fat relative to body weight. So there are certain uh, treatments out there that may be able to hone in and target this obesity and heterogeneity to uh, treat the appropriate uh, risk modifiers as well as those who have the highest risk based upon how much visceral and ectopic fat burden that they have. So how does this happen? How does ectopic fat occur? 
Well, at the very basic level, it's a balance between caloric intake and energy expenditure. And when caloric intake is high, energy expenditure is low, you get a positive energy balance. Now, normally those excess triglycerides are stored in the adipose organ, which is in the subcutaneous region of the body, often in the subcutaneous uh, fat in the stomach or abdomen area or the lower body, such as the hips and buttocks. But when in a situation when you can't, um, the, where their fat cells cannot, no, can no longer multiply and you reach a critical point of uh, adipocyte hypertrophy um, rather than hyperplasia. So the hypertrophic adipose tissue can become inflamed, which can lead to increasing lipolysis and spillover of free fatty acids into the circulation. And then they can then deposit in multiple different organ systems throughout the body. And so it's at the, at the very basic level, an imbalance between the loading and export of lipids, which can result in ectopic fat accumulation in organs and have dire consequences. So to, to describe this further, um, I'd like to kind of paint a picture using epidemiology to show you how visceral and ectopic fat relates to health outcomes uh, in data that we've been you know, looking at now for the past 30 years, but uh, many of the studies that I've been involved with uh, before I here, came here to UH. So one of the first studies that um, I did actually as a fellow was look at the diabetes incidence by abdominal fat distribution in Dallas Arsta, right? Did different fat areas, or we call them depots, such as visceral fat or abdominal subcutaneous fat, do they have different relation to the incidence of diabetes? So in a, about 700 patients with obesity, every one of the BMI over 30, um, this graph just shows you between tertiles of visceral and subcutaneous fat, what the incidence of diabetes was uh, over about seven to eight years. And as you can see very clearly, there is a significant gradient in dose response to the amount of visceral fat an obese patient might have with diabetes incidence, whereas subcutaneous fat uh, appears relatively neutral without an association uh, with increasing incidence of diabetes. If you would then model this, um, using known risk factors for diabetes incidence, including uh, fructosamine, which is kind of like an A1C, it's a glycemic marker of long-term or inter intermediate term control, fasting glucose, weight gain, blood pressure, and family history of diabetes. It turns out that visceral fat mass is one of the strongest and most pre predictive risk factors for diabetes incidence in this population. So the higher visceral fat mass you have for every standard deviation you go up, you have an over two-fold uh, uh, higher odds of developing diabetes. Now, this pattern was, uh, is also holds true for incident cardiovascular disease. Um, so we did a similar study in the Dallas Heart Study in close to 1,000 patients with obesity, followed them for uh, up to nine years, and saw what, you know, how many people developed cardiovascular disease. And in this case, the outcome included both atherosclerotic and non-atherosclerotic, cardiovascular disease, such as heart failure and uh, atrial fibrillation hospitalization. And again, what you see is a gradient between the lowest quartile of visceral adipose tissue and the highest quartile. And it's about a, you know, a two-fold uh, increase in incidence of CVD between those, you know, who's at the lowest level of visceral fat and who's at the highest level of visceral fat. And you can apply this to several other outcomes as well, and you see a similar pattern. And indeed, when you model this uh, with all the different fat depots that we were able to look at on Dallas Sark study, um, we find that visceral fat indeed was associated with a higher risk for CVD. And uh, interestingly, this lower body subcutaneous fat, which is fat that's in the hips and buttocks area, would seem to be protected. And this is a concept that's actually been seen in other health outcomes, such as hypertension, especially in women, um, and one that I think deserves further study. Because the concept is, is that lower body subcutaneous fat is a healthy fat and a buffer for those excess lipid spillover and a way the body to shunt the excess triglycerides to be stored in an inert way without affecting uh, the cardiometabolic uh, system. And I think what's interesting also from this study was that abdominal subcutaneous fat and liver fat were not associated with cardiovascular disease. So as you can imagine, um, looking at BMI and even waist circumference alone is not going to be sufficient to risk stratify patients or disease once you're looking in obese patients. Uh, and the reason for that is because visceral and abdominal subcutaneous fat both make up the abdominal uh, compartment and waist circumference is a measure for both. 
So you really need dedicated imaging to tease these apart. And we see a very similar pattern when we look at hemodynamics um, and the potential you know, parallels to heart failure, including most, most importantly, a concentric remodeling and diastolic dysfunction heart failure phenotype that's consistent with HEF-PET, heart failure preserved ejection fraction. So we did a study, um, in this, this case was uh, all patients, not just obese, um, in Dallas Heart Study, where they got MRIs and we were able to measure cardiac output and uh, systemic vascular resistance, or SVR. And we see this dichotomy again, that visceral adiposity is associated with lower cardiac output and higher SVR, certainly a phenotype that um, lends toward uh, cardiac dysfunction and heart failure, whereas lower body fat uh, is associated with higher cardiac output and lower systemic vascular resistance. And again, abdominal subcutaneous fat seemed to be relatively inert and neutral. So um, again, it, it's very important to discern body fat depots because it, it may indeed uh, spell um, uh, you know, differences in risk for not just ASCVD, but heart failure as well. Now there are other ectopic fat depots that people are looking at. Um, and one of them is liver fat. Um, and especially because rates of NAFLD, non-alcoholic bile liver disease and NASH non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, which is now actually in some circles called MAFLD, metabolic associated liver fat, liver, fatty liver disease, um, is, is a very hot topic, especially because rates of uh, NAFLD or MAFLD related cirrhosis and liver, uh, chronic liver disease uh, are becoming more prevalent as the obesity epidemic increases, leading to uh, higher rates of transplantation. Um, and so liver fat is certainly a very important key factor. And I'll, and I'll mention it you know, a little bit later in my talk. But the one I'd like to focus on right now may you know, be less uh, relevant or recognized by some, but it's actually a, a fat depot that you can see anytime you do a CT scan of the heart or the chest, and that's epicardial or pericardial fat. And the thinking here is that when pericardial fat uh, lands on the surface of the heart, it's contiguous with the epicardial coronary arteries, and therefore the adipocytokines that it secretes may indeed have direct uh, impact on not only the coronary arteries, but also the myocardium. And so this study uh, at the Framingham cohort uh, several years ago already showed that there was indeed a, a strong relationship between the amount of pericardial fat um, and coronary heart disease and MI with no real uh, association uh, when adjusted for stroke. So again, it's this concept that if the fat is right there and able uh, to interact with the cardiac muscle and the coronary arteries, there may indeed be higher risk. Um, and this has been also shown for AFib because the concept is that these adipocytokines get into the myocardium and cause fibrosis um, and metabolic derangement leading to atrial fibrillation. Um, and I'm, I'm part of right now a, a project um, with researchers at the University of Miami to look further at this relationship between pericardial fat and AFib. Now an emerging health marker uh, is muscle fat infiltration. And, and the only reason we were able to actually discern this is with advanced imaging um, and the advent of, of better imaging techniques ha has borne this out. Um, and so for this is just one example of patients who have a similar age, similar BMI, and in this case, actually a similar level of visceral adipose tissue. But again, you see, despite that, there's additional heterogeneity in muscle fat infiltration. So some one, one of these patients has low muscle fat infiltration, uh, another has higher, another has higher than that. So again, there, there are significant differences in body fat, how much you accumulate in different areas, um, even when you're talking about someone with high visceral fat. So, um, you know, all, all of these different uh, metrics, you know, play a role and may play into a prediction of risk. Um, and it's, it's really important to, to take a comprehensive look um, at these when doing a risk assessment. And what I think also illustrates that concept is the idea of ectopic fat discordance. So again, you may think that uh, people with high levels of visceral fat will have high levels of liver fat. And indeed, you know, in many cases, that's true, that they're concordant. High, high fat equals high liver fat. Um, but we, there are individuals where you can have uh, high levels of fat, for example, in the visceral depot and low levels of liver fat and vice versa. And so you wanted to know what was the uh, you know, relationship between those phenotypes and incident cardiovascular disease. So we looked at 
this question in the UK Biobank um, of over 22,000 people out of the UK, and everyone had uh, MRIs of the body fat. Um, and as you can see, for one, there's definitely a higher prevalence of concordant patients than there are discordant. What was interesting is that the patients with highest visceral fat and low liver fat, these discordant uh, phenotypes, uh, there was a relate, there was a higher uh, incidence or hazard, excuse me, for uh, incident cardiovascular disease. Um, and it was actually the only one to hold up after adjustment. So what it, what it means is that, you know, there are phenotypes out there where you know, if someone is uh, obese or high, uh, high amounts of adipose tissue, where it goes really does matter. Um, and you can have situations where it, it might go to one area uh, and not another, which may pretend differential risk uh, information. So now that I've kind of described the concept of obesity heterogeneity, um, hopefully understand uh, more of a visceral and topic that are and their relationship to adverse outcomes, especially in cardiometabolic disease, um, I want to spend a little time on clinical implications of obesity heterogeneity and assessment of, of, of risk. So, you know, tomorrow when a patient comes to you in, in clinic or, or in the hospital um, and, you know, they happen to be obese. So, you know, it's important to take a look at that patient, understanding, you know, things that we're describing today and say, how would I you know, best assess this patient's risk uh, of getting uh, cardiometabolic disease? So first of all, it's important to you utilize this information for risk stratification. And whether that information comes from advanced imaging um, or we're working on uh, you know, biomarkers and, and blood blaze testing to, to try to you know, be correlates of visceral and ectopic fat, the risk stratification concept can really help you determine which patients uh, are at highest risk and therefore would benefit the most from our intensive lifestyle modification, pharmacologic therapy, and bariatric surgery. And another idea uh, is that what if you could ship body fat from one depot to another, shift it from the visceral uh, compartment to the subcutaneous compartment or the lower body compartment where fat redistribution uh, may actually indeed um, lower one's risk without actually losing any weight. Uh, or BMI. So to illustrate this concept further, in order to understand how much visceral ectopic fat one has, you really need dedicated cross-sectional imaging. Uh, this is a table out of a, um, a review that we did uh, recently, and it shows that there are many ways to find body fat uh, in different areas. Computer tomography, CT, and MRI are two of the most powerful because they are the most accurate and the most precise. Um, and they can uh, identify body fat in multiple different areas. In one neck to knee scan, you can get visceral fat, lower body fat, muscle fat, liver fat. Now, MRS has been used in usually research uh, settings to look at uh, fat in liver, skeletal muscle, myocardium. DEXA, or dual electric absorptiometry, which is usually used for bone mineral density, there are, can be used and there are programs to uh, identify uh, visceral adipose tissue and separate it from uh, general uh, total, you know, total body fat uh, or regional fat. Ultrasound and echo uh, have some utility in identifying uh, these, but are, you know, not um, ideally suited for this. And then uh, FGG PET um, can really only identify one important type, which is brown adipose tissue, which I haven't uh, touched upon today, but is an emerging depot that's actually protected, although relatively infrequent uh, in the amount um, in adults. So as I mentioned, MRI is one of the most powerful tools that we have to identify body fat. Um, it can also identify muscle mass. I work with a company in Sweden uh, to do a six minute rapid neck to knee scan that's 3D, accurate, precise, and actually can be performed at any platform between GE, Siemens, and Philips. And what it gives you is really dedicated, detailed information about body fat and where it is. Not only that, but it's able to under, give you, uh, you know, your body fat in comparison with a normative data set from UK Biobank and where someone might stand. So for example, this patient um, is uh, in visceral fat, that orange dot represents where they lie on the spectrum. And they're, you know, higher than normal. Greens are normal. Um, same thing with subcutaneous fat. Interestingly enough, this patient has relatively normal liver fat. 
So again, these, these type of uh, you know, metrics and uh, tools can really get nitty and gritty down in, in detail, very detailed about fat and muscle measurements. And the question is, will that impact care? Um, and despite the fact that for the last 30 years, these methods have been developing, we are, they're not currently utilized in any clinical settings. And so there's a, you know, there's a, I have a project that I'm working on to actually take a look and see if giving a detailed body fat assessment in a clinical setting, you know, compared with just supplying the patient with weight and BMI, will that actually change risk perception, potentially behavioral change, and will improve clinical outcomes. So we have a study called Body Real, which um, we hope to start uh, this year that will, is designed actually to do just that, to randomize patients in a two by two design to advanced body fat imaging assessment versus standard weight and BMI. And then to see actually if giving the, that information to directly to the patient or to the provider uh, will, uh, you know, has any benefit in terms of uh, behavioral change and risk perception. So beyond just identifying it with advanced imaging and changing behavior, um, we have several interventions for obesity uh, now in 2021 that the assessment of visceral adiposity can add nuanced information um, to help identify which therapies may be indicated for which situations. Um, and you know, that spans the gamut from non-pharmacological to pharmacological and surgical. And with regard to treatment intensity, it really might depend on investigation of fat distribution and the presence of an atherosclerotic dyslipidemic profile, um, and in terms of how many and how intensive you want the risk factors to be. So, you know, non-pharmacological or lifestyle is uh, the foundation of any obesity therapy um, that we have, and it's extremely important. And it's been shown that lifestyle modification alone can really significantly reduce visceral and ectopic fat. Um, in fact, the amount of weight loss that one achieves with lifestyle benefits actually inadequately reflects the benefits in fat depots. So this is one specific example out of a study in Israel uh, where patients in the workplace were randomized to an intensive lifestyle intervention that included mo diet modification and physical activity. And in general, with these modalities, the weight change was about 5%, uh, or sorry, five kilograms, which um, is relatively modest. But if you take a look at the modification of the fat uh, using advanced imaging, it's much to a much greater degree, um, and you know, especially with things like liver fat, um, than you would actually be able to um, predict just from weight change alone. Um, so that, you know, patients were able to drop their liver fat from 28% to 5%. Uh, abdominal fat, you know, cut it, uh, cut it in almost a third. So, and, and this is true for, for multiple credit fat depots. So lifestyle alone um, is important and it should not, uh, and, and BMI or weight uh, should not necessarily be the only metric we use to uh, assess uh, improvement um, and, and, the, uh, and, the, um, uh, and the utility of, of my lifestyle modification, because indeed, the body fat may be getting much better, even though the patient's weight may only be going down slightly. So pharmacologic treatment uh, is also a very important adjunct to lifestyle in, in appropriate patients, especially those who um, are unable to lose weight effectively uh, with non-pharmacologic means, uh, and certainly if they have um, pre-existing comorbidities uh, you know, at higher levels of BMI. Um, and there are many different options uh, now in 2021. GLP-1 receptor agonists are probably uh, you know, top on the list in terms of effectiveness with a uh, low, you know, low side effect profile. So we wanted to look actually at what the effect of a GLP-1 receptor agonist, in this case, araglutide or Saxenda, would be on visceral ectopic fat. And so we did a trial that we re just recently completed where we randomized patients uh, to uh, once daily liraglutide or placebo for about 40 weeks on treatment. And the primary outcome here was a change in visceral adipose tissue percent. So first of all, what you can see from this waterfall plot, and here each bar represents an individual participant in the trial and you know, uh, their change in visceral adipose tissue. The bars in red are those assigned to liraglutide and the bars in blue are uh, those assigned to placebo. And in general, what you see is that patients who are assigned to liraglutide um, almost exclusively lost change in visceral adipose tissue, whereas patients assigned to placebo 
about 50% loss and 50% gain uh, over the trial, which was about 36 uh, weeks uh, median following. And what we found was that the reduction in visceral adipose tissue and liver fat, you know, dwarfed the uh, reduction relative to weight, BMI, and waist circumference. So for example, here, uh, patients uh, uh, on liraglutide had an estimated treatment difference of 11% placebo corrected, uh, a visceral adipose tissue reduction. Liver fat was decreased with liraglutide by 33% relative to placebo. In comparing that to weight, about 5%. So although, you know, lifestyle modification uh, in this trial, everyone, everyone received diet modification, physical activity recommendations, and, you know, people were able to lose uh, weight, but visceral adipose tissue, the amount was much greater relative to how much uh, weight they lost, about twofold. And so again, it uh, behooves us to really understand, you know, when we're treating patients with uh, these uh, pharmacologic agents, should we just be following the weight and BMI? Or are there better metrics to really assess um, improvement and, and progress? Because this adipose tissue, for example, is such a key driver of cardiometabolic disease. Would that be something uh, that's better to monitor therapy with? And that remains to be seen. But what I think what it also uh, demonstrates is that uh, SGLP2 inhibitors and GLP1 receptor agonists, which are now are you know, drugs of choice for a myriad of issues, and not only just diabetes, but also ASCVD, heart failure, uh, and sometimes obesity, that both of these medications can modify visceral adipose tissue. And I think it's, it's therefore not a surprise that they are top on the list um, for treating multiple cardiometabolic abnormalities. Um, and so whether it be the, EA, the uh, Europeans or the ACC or the AHA, um, these medications should be on you know, first line or, or add-on therapies to standard um, metformin for diabetes and certainly should be thought of as part of the heart failure armamentarium that we have. But finally, surgical therapies for obesity uh, are gaining uh, strength. And I work closely with uh, Dr. Kaiten and her uh, team on bariatric surgery uh, to you know, assess patients for risk and, um, and also improve risk factors around the time of surgery. Um, and there are multiple options, you know, going from gastric banding to sleeve to bypass. And in general, the weight loss you see with these modalities, um, you know, are, are higher uh, is more than you would get with um, pharmacologic therapy and lifestyle intervention alone. And one of the first studies to show this was the uh, Swedish obesity study, SOS, uh, way back now in 2004, that showed that patients were able to lose uh, up to 35, 40% and actually have sustained weight loss over 10 years of follow-up um, with a gastric bypass and other procedures compared with control. And 10 years later, we had the Stampede trial, which was the first to show that various surgery versus medical therapy can actually cause remission of diabetes. And so compared with medical therapy alone, which patients were able to um, have remission of diabetes about 10% of the time, the sleeve, the sleeve and also the gastric bypass uh, had a much greater fold, uh, uh, you know, uh, incidence of, of uh, diabetes remission. And so again, it's a very effective uh, method we have for weight loss in general. And there are data out there that uh, the visceral adipose tissue and other um, abnormal fat depots can be modified by bariatric surgery, again, to a greater degree in some cases than the amount of weight loss alone. And oftentimes in gastric bypass, uh, surgeons will do an omentectomy where uh, they actually remove the visceral adipose tissue. Uh, and there's you know, data, uh, usually, mostly preclinical data, where doing that um, can actually show really big improvements in your metabolic um, and, and metabolic modulation. So just to summarize, and I'll take a few questions here at the end. What I hope you know I've showed you today is that obesity really is a heterogene heterogeneous uh, entity, and that although obesity is a risk factor for cardiometabolic disease, I don't think anyone's debating that. Uh, certainly not me, uh, but I think it's important to recognize that the heterogeneity of the BMI limits risk prediction and prognostication for many patients. And I think that adipose tissue distribution, uh, certainly a focus of my research um, and clinical interest, adds nuanced information for risk assessment. And I do think that visceral fat is the most, you know, the most important fat depot uh, for cardiovascular disease risk, whereas other epitopic fat depots uh, may be important, important in certain situations, certain disease states, but can associate the shared risk factors and may directly contribute to disease. 
And then modifying these visceral and ectopic depots may indeed decrease risk. And so trying to focus on, uh, on the adip adiposity um, location and amounts uh, in visceral and ectopic depots, as opposed to just focusing on one's weight or BMI, um, can be very important for not just identifying who should get therapy, but monitoring that therapy as well. So we know that lifestyle modification, pharmacologic therapy, and bariatric surgery can all be effective for weight loss, but they also are effective for treatments for visceral obesity, and in many cases can modify the visceral uh, uh, depot more than weight alone. And so going forward, uh, one focus of you know, research and hopefully clinical uh, uh, utilization here is to use MRI and other metrics and techniques to identify high-risk adiposity, um, to recognize obesity heterogeneity and utilize it for care of our patients. And certainly a goal uh, that I strive for here um, at UH and hope to uh, give you some good updates maybe in the future um, when we get those trials finished uh, with, them, with some exciting results. Just uh, like to acknowledge um, you know, my colleagues and my team here, um, Sanjay Rajagopalan and Sadir Alkindi, my uh, partners in crime uh, in cinema and cardiovascular prevention. Um, certainly the cinema team, including um, uh, our, our administrator, Sarah, Elke, our nurse navigator, and Jan, our diabetes educator and nutritionist, the HHBA leadership, um, and then Department of Medicine. And of course, my UH colleagues, many of whom I've been privileged to, to meet and interact with, uh, others uh, less so because of the COVID, but um, I do hope that uh, you know I can meet uh, more of you in the future. Please reach out to me if you have any questions about uh, cardiovascular prevention, what I spoke about today, um, you know, research collaborations. I'm really um, excited to be here. I'm coming up on a year in August being at UH and um, I appreciate the support um, and working in a great collaborative team. Here is the CME code again, for those of you who missed it. And I think it was also in the chat and uh, be happy to take uh, questions in the last few minutes that we have. All right. Thank you. you know, when I, when I interviewed you for uh, uh, residency many, many years ago, I predicted this great success. So thank you. Um, okay. so, thank there, you. so uh, one of the questions I was gonna ask, and it's related to one of the questions in the chat is the MRI, the sort of screening MRI for liver fat, visceral fat, what's the expense and does insurance cover it? So right now there is no clinical, um, method for doing this there's not not approved in the us as a device um and so there's no obvious insurance coverage and there's no clinical expense you know that's um that's been decided upon by any insurance payers but what i hoped is that uh will become the very first center in the united states to do this clinically and the reason i say that is because i'm working with the company in sweden to actually try to make that happen they have they put in their uh, device uh application uh, to use this clinically recently, or this goes in actually in July, and we may be what the first site, one of the first sites to actually test this in a clinical setting uh, to move that ahead. That's awesome. Congratulations. So a uh, few in the chat, Chris Longnerker asked, uh, do you believe heart fat is truly a mediator of disease or just uh, a marker of dysfunctional adiposity? So when you say heart fat, there's actually two flavors. There's pericardial epicardial on top of the heart, and then there's intramyocardial triglyceride, which actually gets into the myocardial cells. Um, what I would say is that the intramyocardial triglyceride, although there's an association between that and diabetes and obesity, it actually is not modified by weight loss. Even bariatric surgery does not change it. So um, in my opinion, intramyocardial triglyceride is not the marker to be looking at. Um, as opposed to pericardial and epicardial fat, uh, you know, I do think that although there's definitely shared you know, share, shared pathway and risk association with visceral fat, and it's a marker of that, there definitely is discordance, again, between people who have low visceral fat and high pericardial fat. So, um, and given the fact that it is, has independent information for, you know, coronary disease and AFib, I think there's something potentially to that as well. Interesting. There's two related questions. Um, what is the cause of visceral fat deposition, genes or hormonal? The related question is, does mitochondrial hapatite influence fat distribution? So for the first question, um, as usual, both, right? So it's both genetic and environmental. Uh, genetic component is, is very strong. And I don't think we actually know why one individual may store all their, you know, have their storage capacity um, exceeded very quickly. And that fat spills over into atopic sites. Whereas another one's able to store fat subcutaneously and uh, the tissue is hyperplastic, just grows and grows. Um, and you're able to store that without any metabolic disease. 
no one really understands that. Certainly there's a genetic component, but, but it, harnessing that and trying to utilize that uh, to, you know, to do something, modify that clinically is, is not, uh, we're not there yet. Um, one thing is in, uh, ethnicity, ethnicity does play a role. So for example, uh, South Asian ancestry, I mentioned the patient, the case at the beginning, that the, the patients of South Asian ancestry tend to have more visceral fat at lower BMIs in these situations. So they may be actually fat on the inside uh, related to, uh, to that. Good. There's two questions about uh, fat distribution in, in South Asian populations or Asian populations versus other groups. Yeah, so um, as I mentioned, you know, South Asians tend to have higher visceral fat at lower BMIs in many cases. They're also at higher risk for critical metabolic outcomes. Um, and so actually South Asian ancestry is a risk enhancer in the um, ASCVD algorithm. Uh, so so is, is, and there's actually gonna be a um, American Heart Association if you're going to, the, to listen to it, it's virtual again this year. But there's gonna be a really good session that um, I was privileged to, to work on with uh, colleagues about that concept specifically. This is awesome. Um, there's a question about vitamin D and adipose distribution. Any? Yeah, um, I don't have much to comment about vitamin D. Unfortunately, um, I have not done any research in that in body fat distribution myself. Um, so I'm not aware too much of, of, the, of the data, but certainly something to look into. Gotcha. And then we had about a minute left. There's a couple of questions what I was avoiding about the most effective diet for adipose, best uh, approach for losing weight. And uh, I know that's that's a whole new grand round. So yeah, <laughs> I'll have you back next year. Yeah, for, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure we can do those those questions justice in a because we got about a minute left. Yeah, what, what I would say is you know ten thousand foot view is that a comprehensive uh, plan that includes lifestyle modification, which includes diet and physical activity or exercise, in addition to um, you know if one needs potentially pharmacological or surgical therapies depending upon the risk level is the most effective. And, you know, I, I think the, the biggest thing is uh, having a support system, having, um, you know, people coach, coach you, help you, um, and sticking to it in persistence is going to be the best, you know, way forward. But always start with lifestyle. And I, I think it's an often over, you know, a, it's an over said cliche and an over, but I think it's also overlooked is, is that, you know, really effective lifestyle takes a lot of work um, and a lot of time and effort. Um, and it's not easy, but there are more resources now than ever, I think, uh, apps or things online to help people succeed. Um, and certainly we have great programs here, like such as Fit or Me with Dr. Rao, uh, to help people succeed uh, in, in, that, in that way too. So uh, we're all in it together and, uh, I, you know, we can, we can, we can do it. So. Well, Ian, this is really exciting work and I want to thank you so much for um, presenting and hopefully uh, more to come next year. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. Appreciate it.